Welcome to the Stonebridge Community Church online worship service. Today you'll hear the Word of God read, the message from this weekend's in-person service, and two songs to guide you in worship. Thanks for joining us today. So, like I said at the beginning of the service, um, we are wrapping up our Stonebridge Spirit Series. Stonebridge Spirit Series. Next year I'll get it right. Um, But... I want to let you all know that the next week we're beginning a new sermon series focused on the book of Jeremiah. It's entitled Embracing Babylon. And in the book of Jeremiah, it's the story of the exile. The people of Judah, the people of God, the people who are in a covenant relationship with God. They're living their lives and then all of a sudden the empire of Babylon comes in and destroys everything and takes a significant amount of them and moves them to Babylon, the worst thing they could imagine happens. But God's advice to them, God's instructions to them are to build houses, to marry Babylonians, to settle where they are now, and to seek the welfare of the place that God has placed them in. So how do you respond when the worst does happen? When the thing that you are dreading actually takes place, how do you respond in those settings? That's what we'll be exploring in that sermon series. So I just want to let you know that that's what's coming up here um, in the next few weeks. But this morning, we are looking at the Stonebridge mission statement, which is to share the hope of Jesus, to deepen our community in faith, and to extend God's love to others. Last week, we talked about deepening our community in faith. Two weeks ago, Pastor Jonathan talked about sharing the hope of Jesus And today we're talking about extending God's love to others. And before I read the scripture passage here, I do just want to give people permission who play fantasy football to check your phones for your lineups for any last minute inactives. It's okay. But at 10 o'clock, we're done. Okay, no football at 10 o'clock until we're done with the service. But next few minutes, go ahead. Just, you know, tell someone you're looking at version. Then go look at version. But I'm going to be reading from 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. And I invite you to hear God's word. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from a skin disease. Now the Arameans on one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my Lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his skin disease. So Naaman went in and told his Lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, go then and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his skin disease? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me, he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the skin disease. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. This is God's word. 
Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have brought us together as a church community. We thank you that you've called us to live life together in this time and in this place, Lord. And we ask that through your scriptures, we would understand what it means to extend your love to others. We'd understand the ways in which we've already done that and the ways in which we can do that in the future. And Lord, through the scripture story, may we understand what your desire is for your church, that we would be your people in this world. So Lord, speak to us now. May your Holy Spirit illuminate these scriptures for us. May we understand your character, your heart at a deeper level, that we might be your church in this world. Lord, through these scriptures, help us to rest in your love that we might extend it to others. We ask this name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this may seem like a bit of a random story. And a lot of times when Naaman's story is told, it's told as just a simple story of a healing. And it is a story of a healing. I mean, Naaman is this military commander from Aram, a foreign nation. And he has a skin disease. Now, oftentimes it'll get translated as leprosy, but we don't know if it's leprosy as we know of leprosy today. It could be, it could not be, but we know it's something that bothers him. And through his wife's servant, he learns of a prophet who might be able to heal him. He goes to his king. His king sends him to the king of Israel. The king of Israel sends him to the prophet Elisha. He bathes in the Jordan and he's healed. On the surface, it looks like a simple story of healing, but this is actually also a story of a potential foreign policy debacle. There's a tension that builds in this story when you look at the details, and it's important that we don't miss that aspect of this story to understand the way in which it was interpreted later on. Naaman is the commander of a foreign army of Aram, which we would call as part of Syria. And when Naaman is sent by the king of Aram to the king of Israel, there is an implicit threat there. The king of Aram is sending his military commander, one of his most important people in his kingdom, to the king of Israel saying, heal him of his skin disease. All of a sudden, the king of Israel now owns this responsibility. That's why he's saying, look at how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. He believes the king of Aram is just trying to start a war, that this is an impossible situation that he's been put in. And Naaman comes with money, we're told. But later on, we learn he also comes with chariots and horses. Chariots and horses are not just means of transportation. Those are weapons of war. So the king of Israel is panicked over this. For them, this is like a Cuban Missile Crisis type of moment. Things are teetering on the edge here, and it could go in a very bad direction. And at this point in the history you get the sense that it's likely Israel would not do well in a conflict with Aram. Naaman seems to be the one who is powerful here. The king of Aram seems more powerful. But then Elisha steps in and says to the king of Israel, why are you upset? This is an opportunity. Send him to me. This is a chance for him to learn that there's a prophet in this land. There's a chance for him to learn about the God that we worship. Send him to me. But even in that, the tension continues to build because we're told that Naaman brings his chariots and his horses to Elisha's house, and they set up there. This doesn't seem like a friendly encounter. Elisha doesn't even come out. He stays in his house, which enrages Naaman. He's so upset. But then his servants avert disaster by saying, why are you whining? This is easy. Go get cleaned. They obviously don't say it that way, but that's the sense we get here. At its core, this is not just a story of a simple healing. This is the story of Elisha seeing an opportunity to share the power of God with a foreigner to share the power of God with an outsider, to let somebody who normally wouldn't know about the God that Israel is connected to in a covenant relationship with, to let them know 
that there is a God who can heal. This is a story about extending God's love to somebody who doesn't deserve it. And what I think we have here is an example of Israel living into its identity as a covenant nation of God. The ancient nation of Israel entered into a covenant with God, not so that they could lift themselves up, not so that they could just protect themselves or secure themselves. If you go back to when God began that covenant all the way with Abraham, Abraham and the promise to Abraham, Israel was blessed so that they could be a blessing to others so that the other nations would be blessed through them. And here in this moment, we have Elisha understanding that. Not responding in anxiety or in fear about this strange foreigner who has come seemingly threateningly. This person who's supposed to be an enemy, Elisha understands he's meant to be a blessing, to let them know of the God that they worship. That's, I think, the way this story is supposed to be interpreted. And it might seem like a bit of a random story, until you realize that Jesus used this story to define his own ministry. In Luke 4.27, Jesus says this, There were also many with a skin disease in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Jesus himself highlights the fact that this story is about a foreigner, a Syrian being cleansed. When Jesus brings this story up, when he uses it to define himself, it's at a critical moment in his ministry in the Gospel of Luke. It's the first public speech that Jesus gives. And like I've said over the years here at Stonebridge, if you want to understand in the different Gospels what Jesus is most focused on, go to his first public statement. In the Gospel of Luke, that's when he brings this one up. It's in Luke chapter 4. He walks into a synagogue. He reads from the prophet Isaiah. He declares himself the Messiah. And then he says this, that in the time of Elisha, there were many in Israel who had skin diseases, but it was a Syrian who was healed. Everybody was happy with Jesus until that point, but when he starts saying that he's going to be about these outsiders, these foreigners, they want to throw him off a cliff. Now he's Jesus, so he escapes. But that's how he defined his ministry. That's what he said he was going to be about. As he was going to go about his earthly ministry, he was going to be focused on those that are supposed to be enemies, on those who are supposed to be foreigners, those who are are supposed to be outsiders. That's who Jesus was going to be focused on, extending God's love to others, to people outside of his own community. That's what his ministry was supposed to be about. And he uses this story of Naaman to highlight that. I believe that that's what every single church is supposed to be about. When you're figuring out what a church is supposed to be doing, it's not rocket science. You look at what Jesus focused on the most, and you do what he did. And I want to say one of the things that I have appreciated about Stonebridge in the four years that I've been here as your pastor is the ample generosity that this community regularly shows. In four years, I've been able to see it firsthand from all of you. And I want you to just remind you all of this last year, what you all did in extending God's love to others. Now, I want to start with just reminding you of some finances. In the last year, you all, this community, sent $4,136 out to Maui after they experienced their fires. We raised money here to send to them to help them rebuild. Through the golf tournament, Stonebridge raised $16,948 for Sarah's house. And then another $4,000 through the baby bottle campaign for Sarah's house. For Samaritan Center, you all raised $2,700 in cash for a supply drive. And we don't have the value for the actual supplies. We had a tent, if you remember a year ago. We filled that tent up with supplies. We don't have the value of that. We are going to do that again in a few weeks, by the way. For James Storehouse, we had $1,500 in cash donations that we sent to them. And then $52,000 in backpacks and supplies that were given to them. For the Haiti fundraiser, to support Haitians who are in need of our support, we sent $11,000. With our Heart of Christmas offering, we had $2,000 each for Sarah's House, James Storehouse, Action and Impact Ministries. And then our deacons sent another 5,400 to Samaritan Center, 2,400 to Action, 4,800 to Community Pregnancy Clinic, 
4,800 to Sarah's house, 4,800 to James Storehouse, and then community and congregational assistance, just our deacons coming alongside people who are in need of some financial help, uh, $15,000 was given out. All told, that's $91,167. I said that awkwardly. $91,167. This community in the last year alone pulled together to bless people who are in need of it so that they could understand God's love. And it's not just the money. Every single month, we have people who organize dinners for Samaritan Center. We had a Sarah's House serve day where dozens showed up at the site of Sarah's House and here at Stonebridge to, to help with the physical space there and to tag items for Tiny Treasures, the store attached to Sarah's House. With James Storehouse, we had people who showed up here to fill those backpacks full of supplies, to get those ready, to write notes of encouragement and prayer to the children in the foster care system who would receive those. And then we had people who went down there to distribute them and to pray for them. We have our deacons who regularly come alongside people who just need help in their home or need a ride somewhere or need to be prayed for or visited when they're sick. Uh, the year before, our youth did their own serve day at Sarah's house. And then this year, our youth put together events to invite their friends so they could have healthy, safe community. So we had kids who were outside of the Stonebridge community coming to the youth events. And then our children, our little children gathered together to make kits for homeless people as well. I want to say, I feel like extending God's love is something that comes fairly naturally to this community. But I also want to say there's more to do. We're not done yet. And this next year, we're going to have more opportunities for you to extend God's love to others. To be connected to the community that God has placed us in. To be connected to the world that God has placed us in so that other people can experience God's love through us here. In a couple months, we're going to have another mission calendar like we did last year. Letting you know which months we'll be working with which partners so that you can sign up, so that you can be involved in that. But I also want to emphasize, extending God's love to others is not something that we just do when we are gathered together. It's something that we are expected to do wherever you are. As individuals, when you go about your jobs, when you go about your travels, when you are with your friends, this is simply what we are to do if we are going to follow Jesus. Our congregation here is built on the foundation of hope in the resurrection of Jesus. That's what pulls us together, the belief that Jesus was raised from the dead, so we will be raised too. We live that hope out in faith believing it to be true so that it affects our lives, it changes our decisions. But the only way the world will know of the hope that we have is if we are extending God's love. That's the final piece, and it may be one of the most important pieces. If we are out there in the community, through every single possible opportunity, letting people know that there is a God who loves them, a God who cares about them, and we model that love through how we treat them. That's how we are the church. When Jesus introduced himself in the Gospel of Luke, he did it using this obscure story of Naaman, where the prophet Elisha healed a foreigner who very likely could have been an enemy. And in doing so, God's love was extended, God's power to heal was extended to somebody that the people of Israel could have never expected it to be extended to. May we do likewise in this next year. May we live into the calling God has given us. May we not get distracted with whatever you see on your news media. May we not get distracted with whatever the world tells you is more important than the mission God has given us. May we be focused on sharing the hope of Jesus, growing deeper in faith as a community, and extending God's love to others so that this world will know there is reason for hope. <laughs>
Tell the world of the dread 